Thanks for tuning in, folks. We're glad that you're here. Uh, Facebook Live, appreciate it. Um, also, what we're going to do is fall color. And it's not just things that turn fall color. What I've got for you are flowers that you plant the fall that have color, grasses that are in the fall in the color, vines, and then some shrubs, but not just uh, deciduous shrubs, also some evergreens that kind of have some nice color to them. I thought I'd cover all of those. What looks good now for the end of the year? That's kind of the class. What I have up here are the flowers, vines, and shrubs, and I thought it's a small enough group, we take a walking tour through the trees. So then we haul all the trees up, and then we can be more interactive amongst the trees. If you see something like, well, then you can ask a question on the fly. So that's kind of the format today. We'll do that all in about 50 minutes or less, depending on how interactive you all are. I can already tell you got a lot of questions, but anyway, we'll try to keep it on track, okay? So fall, we are definitely four seasons. This is going to be really valuable for you from the desert, Southern California folks, and you just don't have four, you don't have four seasons. So these are all plants you probably are not familiar with at all. Even those folks in the Midwest, we're such a mild climate that you're used to those hardy, just super crazy hardy fall colored plants. We grow all of those, plus double that, because we're mild enough we can have, we can go all the way to zone eight, depending on what elevation you're at or what side of the hill you're at. What you're finding right now is you're seeing a lot of red, you've seen a lot of gold and orange, those are the sumacs, they always set the stage, and that's this guy right here, where my sumacs, right here. This one has been in color for a month already. It kind of announces, as soon as it says autumn, September 21st or 2nd, whatever that is, this is starting to show color. This is a native, grows wild. Just You'll just see this growing wild up in your walks in the forest. This is a low grow sumac. It's hardy as can be, you cannot kill this unless you overwater it. Some of you gardeners can kill it with kindness. For the rest of you, plant in the ground, water it a couple times, kick dirt at it, spit on it, go on that cruise for two months, and come back, it's still alive, looking great. So this is a, this is a native plant does very well. Uh, I use this as a ground cover on hills, erosion control, uh, difficult areas. I use this to kind of, because it fills in his runners, kind of fills in. This is a, a grow of sumac. I also have this one. This tiger, I use a lot of tiger ice. But that's, oh, this is a smooth sumac. This is a taller sumac. Same thing, isn't that beautiful? It's been in color for a month. Again, the next windstorm, It'll probably just be, we get this interesting red, smooth bark. It's very, even without foliage, it's stunning. Uh, it gets up about this tall, this wide. So I'll use this as a backdrop. It's fence lines, that kind of thing. I want to bring the eye forward towards a piece of art or a pond or, or, or a lawn. I'll use this out there where it gets kind of abused. Uh, these can also put on seed heads, it's a sumac as well. This is a stag horn sumac. They're kind of the same, only this has red smooth foliage. This has a fuzzy, almost like a velvet and antlers or deer kind of thing. This has a texture to it. This one happens to get this red seed pod, which is very interesting. Starts in summer and holds that seed right through winter. It's amazing. So again, tough, negative. You're never going to have more than, you're never going to have just one of these. They like to run and spread. They like to make merry. They like families. They like, uh, they like groups and clusters. You always see group sumacs in groups. So there might be a little maintenance if you're, if they're showing up in places, maybe it's really well maintained, fertilized a lot, a lot of water, they'll tend to populate fast. Put them out where they get neglected. They seem to do better. So this I'll put on my, this I planted, uh, I get behind the pond. I watered it for one year, and I took that dripping matter, bent it back, and it's never been watered again. Happy, happy, happy. That's how to treat the sumac. These are all, all three of these are cousins of each other. And the reason we have so many different types of sumacs is because they're native, they just grow wild. Now, a little negative, or, or something uh, that comes up sometimes, there is a poison sumac. If you, it's like poison ivy, if you get it on your skin, it'll actually cause bubbling. And, uh, we don't sell those. <laughs> so we're not going to have them. But they are kind of related to each other. One has, they have a milky sap to them, which is why animals don't eat them. 
So javelina, deer, rabbits, leave all sumacs alone because they've been trained. Some of these are poisonous. Don't eat that one and don't eat this one either. So that's a good one if you're in that forest interchange. Those are great choices for you because you're not going to have the pressure. They're just pretty. Or else, let's go with grasses. Now we're all familiar with campus grass. It's in bloom right now in the parking lot. The grass is about this tall with great big plumes on it. Um, that's campus grass. Now personally, I mean, my name's Ken. We're just friends. We're talking over the fence in the backyard, just kind of comparing notes. I would never plant a pampas grass myself. It's too much maintenance. You gotta cut it back every year to keep it healthy. It's kind of short-lived again. Uh, after about five years, it'll start to die out in the middle. It just has this ring, and then you're then about eight years into it, you hate it, and it takes a backhoe to dig it out. I don't care for pampas. I love the plumes. I plant it out by the, the landscape. I should be telling you folks this on, online, but this is posterity, you're okay here, it's forever. But we plant it in the parking lot because it's such a showstopper. I just sell hundreds of them because they're out by the parking lot. But I'm your, I'm your friend, I wouldn't plant one myself. It's just too much. They're stunning, they're beautiful. If you do ha absolutely want one, I would go with the dwarf. They call it, there's one called ivory feather pampas grass. It's dwarf, so the regular pampas grass gets 10, 12 feet huge. The ivory feather only gets about head high. It's just half the height. It's just a little less problematic. Not problematic. If you like them, great, go for them. If you're a gardener, you love chainsawing stuff, go for it. They're good plants. They do really well here. I just don't want that kind of maintenance myself. I prefer, this is called red sedge. I use a lot of this actually. I've got a huge tiki head. Kind of weird. It's garden art. Planter. It's tiki like Easter Island's head. And I put this in the planter, it looks like grass, it looks like hair. It's, it gets so many comments from guests and family that comes over. It's stunning, but it just does this. And this is its, this is its natural color. It's not fall color, it's a red grass. Very if you plant these with things like something gold at the base or candies kind of thing. Now, when I first planted this in the planter, it's pretty good size. I put some of these around it, it looked good, but then eventually this took over and it's just grass now. Two years later, it's only only this. So it's a perennial grass. I really don't even cut it back very much. I mean, in the spring, I might cut it back, and that, that's pretty low care. Sedge does really well. And then it spreads over the years. It clumps. I would say don't expect it to seed or grass or do very much. Pretty much, it'll do that times this much. And it's this. It's only going to get this small. And so it's far less maintenance than, than anything else. This one grows wild. This is a uh, regal mist, muley grass, or deer grass. It's a lot of names. You'll just see this pink glow. You'll see a lot of grasses with this pink hue to it. That's this, this grass. Again, it's a bunching grass. Kind of grows like this. Can seed every once in a while if it's really happy. Uh, but basically, you're, you're planting this for this. Spectacular in the sunset comes through or lights up the, the, right, the seed heads, it's spectacular. Drought hardy. The way you're gonna kill this is if it gets in the ground, it's really heavy clay, in the winter we get a lot of snow and wet and moist, and the roots will rot. So this is one you want good drainage, or amend it pretty heavily when you plant it, and it'll do just fine. But this is as tall as it gets right now. That's a fully mature, like you never see a one gallon that size. It's like a two gallon plant in a one gallon size. It's just stunning. Oh my gosh. It's pretty. Do you eat it? Uh, deer do not eat it. No. No, they're fine. I don't think they eat sedge either. Huh. I don't know about the sedge. They have a lot of deer. They, they don't do the other one. Your neighbors are feeding them or something? The deer? Uh, they love my protein. <laughs> oh yeah. I'm gonna borrow this chair just to make it a little easier for these smaller plants to show it off like this. This is spirea, um, limoncello spirea. Now it's a green plant with a yellow hue to it. So, uh, now this is barberry, I'm sure it's got spines. Yeah, barberry. Barberries do really well. Anything with a needle or spine or does well here. This one's exceptional. So very, very tough. Uh, there's lots of different barberries. There's 
gold, green, red, burgundies, lots of different colors, lots of heights differences. They all do well. The limoncello that lights up with this orange. It's just starting to go into color now. It has this bright orange to it. And then when it's all done, it's got this red, these red stems that come up. I use this, I use barberries in containers, raised beds, and it's just cute, small, little, easy to maintain shrub. So perennial comes back every year. It will lose its leaves. Uh, so it's gonna, it's losing its leaves now. It's turning color. Another month it'll be, usually by the end of it, by Thanksgiving or so, you just get this interesting structure to it. I like barberries in that they look good with their foliage or without. Another interesting fact about barberries, some of them, not all of them, will put little berries on. Just it adds some interest to it. But anyway, that's just pretty ball color. Barberries. Other deciduous shrubs. This one's spirea. Which variety is this? Gold flame? Gold flame spirea. Now in the spring, it pushes brand new foliage. It's a bright lime green. Very pretty in a dark, you got dark rock or a, or a flower bed that's got a lot of dark uh, mulch and that kind of stuff. The light colored flower uh, foliage looks kind of like that. But then in the fall, it turns red. Very interesting to see gold colored plants turning red. Adds a lot of interest to your fall colored plants. And then spireas, deer don't eat. Guaranteed. So it's a, it's a good plant for, uh, spireas in general are, are a good plant. Have an old fashioned plant, but they've always done so well. And they love the climate here. I also, another thing about this, I grew this one underneath my juniper. Because I wanted that bright, it's real dark underneath this great big alligator juniper. Um, I wanted something that stays low, not fire. Out of fire, I wanted it to be fire wise, that's this, and I wanted it to be bright. And so I planted this, and it just gives a nice, good mounding. So it's, it's less than knee high. It's been in for like five years. Just a nice big mound about like this, knee high. Real, real pretty. The bonus has a pink flower in spring, just covered with pink flowers. Very nice. Spireas do anything that says spirea or viburnum. You see those two, the kind of your grandparents grew a lot of viburnums and spireas. That they do really well here, and they're they're tough. Lastly, on the shrub piece for this, and I got two more. That is a perennial. All of these that I brought are perennials, except for the flowers. I'll show you those in a second. Okay. This is like my neighbors. There's a, there's bright red right now. This is burning bush. This one. Um, happens to, it's just starting to, to show color. Another week, it'll be bright red, like fire engine red. Like, like turn a light switch on, painted an artist red. It's that. It's spectacular. Uh, it is deciduous, it'll lose its leaves. I guess there's the color. You can see that. That's, that's the color. So fire engine red. Gets up about like this, this tall, hip high or so, hip wide. Kind of nice mound to it. The beauty with this is people plant it for the foliage. But the stems you get a chance after the class. Look at the stem just got ridge lines going up and down it. Very unusual. If you're if you're an artist, say a florist kind of thing, it'd be interesting just to have this as, as structure in a, in a flower arrangement. Very very unusual, but very tough. Um, I don't know about deer. You're gonna ask me that every time. So yeah, about about hip high or uh, it's called Bernie Bush. Yeah, what's the variety? Oh, I don't know. The variety is dwarf, Burning Bush. That's, that's all they got. So the botanicals on there, you can look at it. Okay. Last shrub I've got, well, I guess I got two. I brought more. <laughs> um, this is Smoke Bush. We, this is on most of your HOA's plant list. Very tough, drought hardy, fire wise. It's got all the stuff you want locally. Um, it also has a flower on top that looks like smoke. That's, that's the name smoke bush. It can get quite large. It gets well above head high. It can even go higher if you let it go. But in the fall, it has this wonderful orange color. So it turns red with this orangey color to it. Very bright color. Just starting to see it show up. Another couple weeks, it'll be full on orange. Good plant for here. So tough, tough, tough plant. But again, don't put that one right next to the house where you'd be cursing it about five years. You'd be constantly cutting it back, keeping it maintained. Put it out by the fence line, put it in the middle of a, of a raised bed where it can be the centerpiece. 
that's where you want to put uh, virgin brush. And then, deciduous. These are all deciduous. They lose their leaves. This is flame maple or amur maple, A-M-U-R. It's quite large. Again, it's like burning bush. They're companion plants to burning bush. They like to grow with each other. But this one has a classic maple leaf. Uh, kind of has a semblance of, of a Japanese maple as far as the leaf size. But this one loves the sun, loves wind, loves abuse, loves to be you know, run over by little kids in, in bikes, run down by, it's just tough. And so it's considered drought hardy. It's that tough for low water use. Um, it can come in a tree form, but mainly the native form looks multi-stem shrubs with the way it grows. Uh, but it'll be bright, bright red. This is this is not good justice. You're starting to see a little bit of the red. That's the color the whole thing will be. Thus the name flame maple, because it's flaming red. Okay, good plant for here. If you like maples, this is probably the toughest of all of the maples that are grown locally. It's not as big as your uh, blaze, matador, the big red maples, uh, but tougher. Okay, is that all the shrubs I have? Let's go over shrubs with berries. I don't, I don't think we, we mentioned berries enough. For bird gardeners, uh, this is when all the berries show up and they'll keep those berries right through winter. So I like to grow plants with berries. I grow this one quite a bit. I've got two giant ones. Anyone know what this is? You got it. You. Is it a Hicks? It sure enough. Good eye. I love gardeners. Hicks U. Mine are, I have a two-story stucco wall. Ugly. I mean, it's got a basement door right there. It's hideous. So I'm going, okay, it's on the north side. Totally shaded. My whole backyard is nothing but natives. There's no native that will grow in the shade two stories high. There's nothing. So I planted two of these on either side of that wall, two of them growing up. They're now at least 10, 12 feet tall. They're tall enough where you can't tell how tall they are. They're that tall. So they aren't up to the ceiling, up to the, the ridge line, but they're, they're going to be. It gets quite tall and columnar, straight up, green, evergreen. I treat it just like my native flame maples, sumacs. I treat them the same. But because it's in the shade, it doesn't dry out, it doesn't get hot, and it thrives, absolutely thrives. In between the two, I put a piece of art. Big old face, it's illuminates like a face this big, just a face. It's interesting, it's comments, it's spooky, it'll scare you at night, but it's uplit, it's kind of neat, it's an artist thing. But this, I use these as frames, but the beauty is they get these red berries. In the shade, there's very few things that get beautiful red berries. Uh, extremely poisonous. Don't eat them. <laughs> don't, 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 do, don't do that. Don't do that. But that's also the reason that animals don't eat these. So deer, javelina, rabbit. Again, this is a good choice in the shade. Great choice and evergreen. I brought it not for fall color, but for fall berries. Interesting. This one you grew. Actually, as a kid, you used to pick these and throw them at each other. The berries as pyracantha. Uh, it's a classic. I think we should bring it back. It's kind of old-fashioned. People go, oh, I've had that. I'm tired of it. No, I don't want that. But boy, it's so tough. Birds love it. In fact, these will ferment, and the birds will have a party on the berries. And they'll, you'll see them stumbling, going, <laughs> oh, more chips, please. They're just loving the berries. Uh, beautiful white flowers in spring. Uh, there are two sizes and two colors. The orange variety is hardier for here. So the red, there's also a red berry one. Some years we go sub-zero, it can, it can kill off uh, the red berry pyrocantha. Don't worry, if it dies, I'll sell you an orange one. But some people really want the red, not the orange. We'll get about 10, 12 years, we get kind of cocky, going, ah, the climate change is now warmer. The winter comes and kills them off. So I would encourage, again, my friends, I would, I would, I would show you the orange one. Just because I know it's going to live no matter what. It also comes in two sizes, short like this, and this big guy. This one you'll see trained up walls, fences, uh, chain link, up, they'll put them up trellises, big, it gets 10 by 10. They'll get them flat or you can just let them go and get some size, say a property line, uh, 
bear, uh, border kind of thing. You can use it for that. A very tough evergreen, but the berries. Run it for the berries. Very pretty. Commercial settings. If you're an investor, you got renters. Go with that. They can't. The renters can't kill it. Uh, that, that'd be a good one. Well, that works as a security fence. It can be a security fence, yes, because it also has a minor. It's got a thorn to it. You wear your gloves when you're when you're put, chipping. You know, printing away at it. Yeah. This one for your East Coast folks is famous. It grows wild on the East Coast. It doesn't grow wild here, but there's a place for it where it's a little more shaded and protected. I would not plant holly out in full sun on the south facing wall. But I would plant it on the east, north, or, or, or direct west in the end of the day sun. It does magically. It's evergreen classic holly leaf, like you're, you're expecting. And then it just has these berries that grows on it. So just real pretty, classic, classic fall and winter kind of, kind of shrub. And it does grow quite well here. Perennial, it'll take our winters no problem. Okay, this one, Catoniaster, or some folks have pronounced it Cotton Easter. It's actually Catoniaster. Uh, all the Catoniasters do well here. Uh, they make great big ones, like uh, Parnii Catoniaster. This one happens to say it's very, very small. So they, this, is, this is fully mature, then it'll spread out from there. It's more of a ground cover kind of thing. But all Catoniasters put on these beautiful red berries. Evergreen, actually this one's deciduous. So the fall color, the foliage will turn gold for these red berries. There's also evergreen varieties. But all your Catoni asters, the deer don't get, they're draw hardy, rabbits don't bother them. Cavalina, don't, they, they, there's just nothing that goes wrong with these. They're tough. We need to plant more Catoni asters, less red tip Bokinias, because they just are hardier for deer than, than let's say, some of the other plants. This one only gets uh, small. This is cranberry. Two, three feet. This is this is fully mature, but it spreads. The uh, coral uh, uh, carnii, like red clusterberry cotoniaster, gets quite large. I mean, like ten by ten, quite big. Yeah. And evergreen. That's kind of nice. This is choke cherry. You see the variety. This grows wild, brilliant red. Okay, so brilliant red choke cherry. It's famous for its fall color, for that and its hardiness. It's a white flower. You'll just see in the, in the wild, you'll see this bush in spring that's got covered in white flowers. Now, where'd that come from? That's this, choke cherries. So it's a, it's a native, very tough. Uh, the, berry, the flowers will turn into this red berry, obviously. And it just has this beautiful fall color. But choke cherries, if you're in a native, a zero scape kind of plants, or you just like pretty plants that are unusual, that are southwestern, choke cherry. I believe animals do not bother this. I don't remember all everything always. There's an encyclopedia up there, so sometimes it takes a while to get the pages all flipped over. But I'm pretty sure this one, the deer, leave this one alone as well. Good, good native, draw hardy guy. And, and, and in fact, I'm sure the deer don't eat that because I'm choking up just handling it. You can feel the pollen or whatever the back side of the leaf. This is a beauty berry. Not unusual. You never see lavender or purple berries on things. They're always red or orange. This one is super tough, pretty white flower in spring. It's got a gold colored fall, fall color, but really you're planting it for these lavender berries. Very tough little plant, only gets up about like this big. And it's, it's an unusual plant. You all are gardeners. You're here to garden class in the fall. You know it's about the snow in two months, right? You're still thinking gardening, but this you gardeners like these unusual, funky, different kinds of plants. Great containers. Planters, right by the driveway, it's where you can appreciate it, actually see the berries. Okay, that's all my shrubs. There we go. Let's go with two evergreens, three, that I think are good, that also have fall color, uh, that are also native. So this one, I use a lot of this. And Californians will love this. And here's a native Arizona that we have. Okay. And so for these three, these are both, all three of these are evergreens. All three of these animals do not eat. You put it right out there and it would be okay, okay? This one is silverberry, or Ellie Agnes is the botanical. Silverberry, uh, the, the native one that grows wild has a gray leaf like this. What we figured out how to do is how to breed 
this gold highlight around it, so, so it's variegated, which I think is stunning, just with the gold. So the new growth comes out like the local native, but then it matures to this gold color. I use this as underplantings underneath my windows, fence lines. Uh, I hide a lot of utility boxes, a huge electrical thing that's out there. I'll hide that, it kind of has that color, and this looks way better than a huge tan colored box, or green box sitting out there. So LA Agnes, good evergreen, animals don't eat it, and it does put a little flower on in spring that you'll never notice, but you'll smell it. Sweet as can be. I think it's just more fragrant than uh, even the light light. But I think this is a better plant than uh, than Retipotinia, even, even than, than Ketoniaster, uh, because I'll water it for a year. Actually, I'll water it until it gets up to size, and I cut it off of all care. And no, I never water it again. It gets up about head high, about six, eight, about this big, where they mature. In my own yard, I use that, uh, that cedar fence that's where the dog run is. I use it because, you know, the fence is pretty, not very pretty. I want it to feel like a secret garden. So I'll plant some of these just to soften up all that hardware. This one you all probably know, very been around forever. This is called uh, Nandina or Heavenly Bamboo. This one I brought from fall color. It's evergreen. If it's in full sun, you'll notice that it will turn red like this. So you've seen it starting to show red. By December, it'll be solid red. No green on it whatsoever. And then by about April, it starts to go turn to green again. Very interesting. In the shade, you'll notice it will stay green. Won't have as much color. It might have a tinge of red, but all your Nandinas, the little harbor dwarf, the one gets this big to your Gulf Streams, to your standard, bigger uh, domestica, the big Nandinas, they all do that. They get the more sun they get into, the redder or oranger. They get reds to oranges, depending on the variety. I brought it just for that example. And animals don't eat that. It looks delicious, but they don't bother it. I want a little range dressing myself to have a bite. They don't eat it. This one you'll see growing wild out in the Bradshaws, up in the ridgelines. It'll, it'll grow the low grade one, the, the uh, uh, prostrate variety, Repens, uh, grows wild. They also make two other models. They make the compact and the standard size Mahonia, or Oregon grape, is what this is. It's an evergreen, but again, I brought it as an example. In the sun, it turns this gray color. In the shade, it stays green. So they, they, it also gets a yellow flower in spring. It has a little berry, little, little form, less than any Oregon grape. It has a little uh, edible fruit to it. They're quite delicious. You'll never get any, because the birds think they've died and gone to heaven and starts to form those for the fruits. They love the fruits. So I'll plant this as a bird sanctuary uh, thing in my backyard. I'm a bird gardener. I, I like to attract birds. So this is one I plant in there just to attract them. I, I have one of those, but it doesn't have a little sticker. You just take the bush that doesn't have a sticker on it. Stickers? What stickers? What are you talking about? So she says she has stickers. Oh, gotcha. So it's not really a sticker. It kind of has a holly leaf to it. It's not really pokey. But yeah, there are genetics for these. So if you see one that has a different leaf type, it's genetically going to be more like that. So yes, pick, curate the one or pick the one that, 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 that calls to you and take me home, plant me. You know those plants do that? They would do great in containers. I would not plant this particular one in the middle of a raised bed or something or in a garden because eventually all that will be left is this. It tends to spread and run. So put it out at the edge. I like to put it right on the edge where the irrigation just barely hits it and again once it gets to size or the, the, the shape that you want i would cut it off of all care don't water it so i might fertilize it just to bring more color out or more uh, flowers in the spring but i wouldn't water it very much if you overdo it you're very aggressive the nuclear holocaust all that's gonna be left are ants and that plant that's all that's gonna be left okay uh, i brought this for the rose gardeners, I, I don't grow a lot of hybrid teas, floribundas, grandifloras, the, the, the fancy ones. Uh, they're just more maintenance than I want to do now. I used to, I've switched over to these. Uh, this is a knockout rose, carpet roses are the same. I've got my entire driveway just has probably a dozen or more roses. 
I like them in the fall. I'm encouraging them to grow right now. I just fertilized them so that I'll get as many of these buds as I can get. Because what I notice with your, your shrubbery kind of roses, ones that aren't grafted, they're just growing on their own rootstock, they'll keep these buds right through in, into the new year. It's amazing how long they'll keep the flowers. The flowers will stay in bloom until about Thanksgiving. But even after we get our first snow, me as a gardener, if I can just see that much color of my rose, that's enough inspiration. I can get through January. I know February's coming. The, the forsythia will start to bloom, and I'll be okay. I just got to get about a six-week gap there where I need something to keep me going. Roses do it. And most years, they're evergreen. They're kind of semi-evergreen. At least they got some structure to them, but not truly fall color, but I, I use them as such. You just, you don't do very much. You don't have to count back three nodes, cut at a 45 degree angle and yeah. pray that it will bloom again. It just does that. It self prunes when it's done blooming. It'll, it'll naturally, that will naturally fall off and set another bud all by itself. That's the beauty with your older fashioned roses. You're never going to enter that flower of the fair yeah. and win any kind of prize, but it will have this kind of flower from the end of April through November. No other shrub does that for color, flower color. Uh, but mainly I was bringing for the buds. The buds just stay on there and have that color right almost through winter. It's amazing. Yeah. How many hours of sunshine does a rose need? That's a good question. How many hours of sunshine does a rose need? I'm trying to help you all online. Okay, I'm here for you. Repeating the question. You keep telling me to do that. I'm trying. Uh, so how many hours? Do you need for most of these plants that I'm covering right now are fall or full, full, full sun, full on sun. The more sun, the better. The definition of full sun at this altitude, mountain gardening, is going to be six hours or more. So if you get at least six hours, all of these that we've, we've played with, except for the shade lovers, what is that, the holly and the yew, those are the two shade ones. Those don't like, I'd say, maximum six hours. But all the rest of them, like this Virginia creeper, give it at least six hours. It will be happy, happy, happy. This is, this grows wild again. I would not call it Virginia creeper. I would rather have this be re renamed across the country as Arizona creeper. But I'm, I've got an agenda. I love Arizona. Uh, this one actually is famous for its fall color. This, this actually is, is, that's its color. It'll actually get even more red in the ground. It'll be even redder. And so this one's interesting in that you'll notice it's not quite as bright as maybe you've seen in your neighborhoods. That's because of alkalinity. There's a quick lesson. You'll see some of your maples that way. You'll see some of your shrubs. Why is that color a little off? Same variety, but the color's off. Or it mutes a little bit, turns more orange or more yellow. Still fall color, but the different depth of red or orange changes. That all has to do with pH, the chemistry of the soil. So if the pH creeps up high, you'll see the color gets more orangey. If it's more acidic, it'll turn a deeper red. That's just, you can tell, I can go through a neighborhood at 50 miles an hour and go, needs, needs more fertilizer, and we'll cover that in a minute. Needs some sulfur, needs, I can tell you how to change that just by the <coughs> color, the fall colors change. Another one you'll notice too, this is something uh, maybe you can help your neighbors with, uh, some, like a maple, I've got a neighbor that their maple turned a month ago red, full red. But that's way too early. What is going on? That's an indication that it's stressed out. Probably from all that rain that we had this summer, it, it's, in a, it's in a soil that isn't perking, isn't draining uh, well enough. And the plant just went, I am sick. I'm putting myself to bed. I'm going to wait for winter. I'm gonna, just going to shed my leaves right now go to bed. You know, wake up next spring. That's you can tell which plants are stressed just by how soon it turns into fall color. That is that's extreme. That's a month ago. Now you'll see in your neighborhood there's some that'll be a week earlier or later. That's not stress. That's just you're near a ditch where all the cold air settles, and so it will turn sooner. You're on the north side of the hill instead of the south side. South side will turn a little later than the north side. You'll just see some variations in the neighborhood. That's not stress, that's just environmental microclimates is the difference. If it's obviously way before anyone else, that plant stress. So, Virginia creeper, good drought hardy plant, animals don't eat it. You'll see it growing wild. 
It'll go up the, it's in the oaks underneath the junipers. You'll see it growing underneath as a ground cover or up the trees. That way, that's where you'll see that. I think we need to use more of these as ground covers. Everyone thinks trellis, fence. I think they make, they naturally grow as ground covers for uh, erosion control, up, up through rocks, boulders kind of thing. That's where they look really, really good. Okay, will that grow uh, up into the cypress? It will. Yeah, it will grow into cypress, junipers. It'll grow up through things. I'll see it pop up through the tops. Kind of interesting. Yeah. Uh, in fact, gardeners, the artists, you know, gardening can be artistic. They'll, they'll combine those because it's so drought hardy, it'll take the same water climate, the same environment as a juniper, uh, and it'll grow up through it kind of like a, like a starburst coming out to the top. Very interesting. Okay. Vines, that's one of the only vines that's really bright. Boston ivy can be close. Of course, they're related. Boston ivy and Virginia people are pretty much the same. They're cousins of each other. They both get great fall color. All right, should we cover the flowers? Uh, fall color flowers. I brought this one, not because of the fall color, but just as a quick lesson. I'm a bird gardener. It's so my galardias and my echinacea, which is what this is. I'm letting go to seed right now, so I don't prune these back. You know, if you keep pruning these back in spring and summer, it will keep forcing flowers. Right now, I'm letting them go to seed because I'm a bird gardener. I'm trying to, I'm trying to woo the, the birds into my yard and nest here, not up there. So I don't feed them, I give them water, and I give them plants. So they camp out at my place and they eat all your seed when they camp out at my place. Uh, but I'm letting them go to seed because they'll use this as a food source in the, in the, in the depth of winter. They'll, they'll eat the seed. So you'll see little sparrows and things all over these. Like they'll flock in like 10 of them at a time, eat all the seed and fly off. But I, I purposely let them go to seed. No fall color, there's not a fall plant. It just Quick lesson on birds. This is called autumn sage because it's so spectacular in autumn. It just has these flowers and it'll, it'll stay on there till mid mid November or so. Loves this chilly night, bright days. I would plant this in full sun, surrounded by asphalt, dark colored rock. Then I take a blow dryer to it. I mean, it loves heat, bright. Uh, just loves that kind of that kind of environment. So it's real tough that way. And then hummingbirds, especially the ones that hang out, the older ones, they just don't know if they can take that flight south again. It's so long. Or the young, really young, this year's fledglings, they're too stupid to fly south. They'll use this as a food source until it just gets too cold. They'll go, okay, there's no more flowers. I better go to Phoenix or Mexico, wherever they go to. Good source because we're in the migratory pattern. The folks that are migrating from Canada, they're, they're going to come through here. It's the water line. The water comes through Arizona. We're on the migratory path. They'll use this as a food source for, for hummingbirds and butterflies, monarchs, swallowtails. Um, I was just in Denver, Colorado, and on the Weather Channel, the weather radars, there was a 70 mile blip of butterflies that showed up on the radar. 70 mile cloud. Could you imagine that many butterflies? They were migrating. They were painted lady butterflies migrating all together. That's a mad thing. That, you can do that here. You can have that same thing. Painted ladies are so common here. They're native. But you just have a few things from the, to uh, you know, drop off in. Yeah. Native, zero scape. Yeah. This starts blooming uh, usually the end of April, and it will keep blooming through. November, not through, sometime in November, it starts to turn fall color and it's kind of done. And that's just tweaking. Also, another insider tip on this, don't prune this back till next spring. If you prune it back too soon, you let your gardener whack at stuff. Um, it doesn't have as much insulation. And so if we get a harsh winter, it can freeze the ground and kill, kill this one off. If you leave the structure of the plant up, it provides enough insulation where it's, it, it survives better. So this is personal experience. I've had some uh, where I've had some struggles. Would it survive better in a pot? I, I grew up in both places. I've got one that's in an urn just spilling out. I've got a great big purple one that's in a huge pot. This big and, and the purple sage or uh, uh, autumn sage is this big. It's magnificent. It's gorgeous. So they're all in full bloom right now. Absolutely loaded with bloom right now. Um, two that I've planted quite a bit, these are both perennials, 
Remember, perennial and permanent both start with T, so there, this is one that comes back over and over again. This is Pucara, or coral bells, that is the common name. Comes in a lot of colors, greens, burgundies, reds, coppers, lime greens. Um, this one I plant, I just planted quite a few of these in my containers because it'll keep this foliage right through winter. If it get really cold, it might get a little bit burned back, but it's real quick to come back and leaf again. But this looks great with things like pansies, a companion plant. This gives me my anchor. So I'm only doing this once in a big pot. I'm doing this once, and I'll replace my annuals. So I blend perennials and annuals together, so I don't have to do it as an other okay. I would rather, personally, have you plant annuals every year, because then you got to come back and plant all new plants every year. But that's not what I do myself. I like to blend perennials and annuals. This one, where are you? I'm just thinking that looks good together. I mean, even, even this, even that looks good. Just you can quickly get some quick combos that like each other. These are both perennials. They just go well. Uh, the red sedge I use quite a bit. So red, red the grass I use quite a bit. Red with that would be striking. Uh, this with this was a combo I put together myself. Snapdragons and Bucara both look good. Uh, snapdragons, I think we need to plant more snapdragons. They're just tough, and we'll eat some. They bloom like crazy. Hummingbirds, butterflies, love them. They get everything you want. Um, the negative is they, they get a little. Uh, they only last a couple of years, and they get a rust. So you can't keep them. They reseed easy. But this plant, you kind of want to replace them every year or so, every two years at most, or they start to get a disease to them, especially if it's real wet. So, but they reseed so easy that if you never get one of these, they always seem to come up in clusters. It's kind of like a wildflower. Snapdragon. A lot of colors to choose from. Of course, the most famous of all fall, colored from moms, chrysanthemums, comes in every color. Uh, quick lesson on moms. You're seeing quite a few greenhouse varieties, which in, in the groceries are floral grade forest. Those are not going to grow outside for you. They're not going to transition. Enjoy them for the flowers and throw them away. They're like a living bouquet. The ones we have are garden moms. They aren't quite as showy, but they're meant to be planted and come back. And this will literally turn in, this will turn into this big. I mean, they're knee high by knee wide, covered in, in flowers. That's what a mom is supposed to do. Okay. Lots and lots of colors. Again, perennial. Here's two more perennials. I use these a lot. This is uh, sedum, autumn joy. Autumn joy, stone crop, or autumn joy sedum. Gets up about, they're about knee high. It's much taller than this. But they're loaded with this flower. And it'll start to, this will actually get brighter and brighter pink, almost a red color as we get into, into fall, less than in autumn joy. Uh, it's, a, it's an evergreen. Actually, it's not an evergreen. This variety is a deciduous, it will, like a true perennial, die back to the ground. Um, a lot of your sedums will, are evergreen, the spreading ones. Uh, there's quite a few down there. This one I plant because of the birds. My little sparrows, when it's early in spring, there's no real, no real other food for them. They'll come in, and this is just coming up. They'll use this as a water and food source. So they'll kind of peck away at the leaves. They'll kind of eat the leaf. And it makes it look a little ugly. But I'm OK. We're just using this until the grass and the other stuff that they like better comes up. And then the pressure will come off of this, and we're going to bloom off this. So I'm using it as a transitional food source for some of my birds. Really plays out well. They love it. Uh, rhubarb, not rhubarb, uh, Swiss chard. Maybe that was Swiss chard as well. I plant Swiss chard to come and eat the, the soft tissues in the leaf. All the stuff is skeletonization. And they don't eat all the leaves. They just eat big ones. I'll let them eat that because it's. I want them. I want them to be happy. And then I usually get enough for myself. Uh, euphorbia. Let's see, exact rainbow. Yeah, Ascot rainbow euphorbia. It's an evergreen perennial. This is the color it's going to be year round. Draw hardy, tough, loves bright sun. I've got one in a container. It's almost, the container's only this big, but it's so hardy. It's right there in the driveway. It's like blistering hot against a wall. Blistering hot. It's happy. It's, it's grown from this to now it's this big. In one year, it's magnificent. But I put it in that little tiny pot 
by the corner where the sidewalk comes to the front door, and he had something that was tough, that everything else was dying. This one just looks so good. So How many look, does it get? It gets maybe 18 inch, like 18 inch wide, kind of a nice little ball shaped kind of thing. It does get a little flower to it. It's kind of a funky, it's like a Dr. Seuss flower. It's kind of interesting. It's not a true flower, it's not like this. But it has a variation of, of a leaf. The, the flower is the same color as this, basically. Very unusual. Gardeners would like it. Could be a mortar, yeah. Uh, the good thing too is all euphorbia, you know, poinsettias, is related to poinsettia. Uh, it's, it's a cousin of that. Only this one takes the cold. When you snap it off, it'll have this milky uh, sap to it, like a poinsettia. And so animals don't like the taste of the sap, so they, they don't they don't eat this. Half rats, uh, they didn't, nothing eats it. Rabbits, euphorbia, good good plant for girl. And then two last ones, just a thought, and then we'll take a walking tour to right on time. So I've taken my tomatoes out. I had a frost in my yard. That cold in September, you remember that? It went from really nice to cold. My backyard froze. The figs froze, the tomatoes, basil, all died. So I had to pull them out. The front yard was fine. The backyard got frozen. Now why, I don't know. Front yard, the backyard's you know, two, three stories lower. So the cold air kind of sells, I think. Front yard's got more patios, and pavers, retained heat itself. The backyard's more north. I think those are all reasons why it froze there, not up here. But I've transitioned all of my summer vegetables to Swiss chard, kale, lettuces. Isn't that pretty? Speckled lettuce, edible, beautiful. You'll never find this in the groceries or even the farmer's market. You've got to grow it yourself. Huge in antioxidants and now you plant it with that looks good together, companion plants, anything gold with that, that dark, you know, uh, burgundy or blues and gold always look good. White, I put some white pansies with mine, looks good together. But think of some of your, your edibles for fall, spinach, beets. There's so many great choices that love the cold to come. I've got broccoli starting to form heads right now. So it's all these things, typically we'll have cauliflower, broccoli, uh, Brussels sprouts for Thanksgiving and Christmas dinner from the garden. Because they like bright days, the cold nights, the flavor's better when it's cold at night. They'll even take some snow. So this guy, you'll harvest this right through winter. We're mild enough to pull that off. Okay. So honeysuckle, berries. So some honeysuckle, actually most honeysuckles, do form a berry. Um, I would leave it on just because how are you going to pick all those berries off? Uh, it's just hard. I would leave them on it just because they're pretty. Yeah. A lot of things, like my mimosa right now, it's, it's turning fall colors into glorious gold. I think it's even a prettier gold than even aspens are. And it's got these beautiful seed, seed pods. And the seed pods have, have dried out. And so when the wind goes through them, it's almost like mariachis. It's got a beautiful sound. I just love the sound of the wind blowing through those seed pods. They'll find they're kind of messy and I gotta clean them up. But it's in that part of the yard where I just don't care that much. It doesn't matter. It's not like a rock lawn underneath it where I need it to be perfect every every moment. I can let it go more natural. Let that feng shui thing happen. You kind of work with nature instead of against it. So I think we can bend with that. And I just leave them. Main thing with honeysuckle, I might shape them because they've grown so much they can grow into. You're brushing up against them as you're going down that side house, wherever that happens to be, I might give them a quick haircut. In March, I would be brutal. And I would just cut them right back to the fence, right back to the trellis. Right, I'd cut them way back. Then I'd fertilize them with the all-purpose plant food, this stuff here. I'd fertilize them with this. And what I do, this is most of my pruning. I've I got a whole class on pruning. I'm not going to go there. But for, for honey, for my friends, honeysuckle, I would fertilize it uh, with this, and it'll just flush all new growth. That way, you keep it maintained. Otherwise, it gets kind of leggy on the inside. It gets kind of empty. That's a way to keep it looking really good. Most of your vines are that way. I would hold off on pruning on things. Keep the structure intact. It'll help insulate. We do most of our pruning late winter. I'd wait till after the new year. 
Um, those are my Ritaputinia, the edgy kind of things. I'll wait. I, I know it's going to flush through growth. It's going to flush growth mid into mid of March through April. So I'll try to prune the first part of March. Otherwise, it looks butchered all winter long. I don't, it's not a good look. I'd rather have it be kind of rangy and natural. I appreciate that. And then I'll, I'll fertilize right before I know the growth is going to happen. And I'll fertilize with this. And that way, I don't have as much of those nips, the, the cuts, the broken branches thing. It looks looks butchered. I don't want that. So I, that's a good secret for especially honeysuckle. You can use this. Yeah, we recommend using this three times a year at the minimum. Spring, summer, fall. Your holidays are Easter, Fourth uh, of July, Halloween. Uh, you know, that's that's kind of a sequence. You're in the middle of fertilizing now. This is the most important fertilizing of the year, fall. This is the food it's going to use to flush, to create next spring's flowers. Critical for uh, spring blooming things, quince, forsythia, lilacs, uh, fruit trees, anything that forms a, a flower or fruit in the spring, you've got to use the food now or you're not going to get the same color, fragrance, or, or fruits at that end. So it's using that fruit now. Evergreens, I think critical, especially for your natives, your ponderosas, your junipers, they're getting pressure from, from ips, great beetle, flathead borer, uh, bark beetles, these kind of things. If you can keep them healthy with once a year fertilizing the fall, they can fight that stuff off by themselves. You just keep them healthy. It's kind of like the flu going to the winter. The healthy people get sick for a bit, they're fine. Those that are young or stressed, they're the ones that die. Forest is the same way. Your backyard will be the same way. Yeah, more than that in. I don't water it in, I just chuck and go. But you as a gardener, I'm giving you permission to work it, water it, do as much work as you want. Me, 15 minutes or less. I put a hand spreader and just go, I'm done. I'm just in. You can do that too. For trees and shrubs, you can do that. Flower beds, probably not idea of lawn, that kind of stuff. Just depends on where it's at. Yeah, it's, it's good. And it's natural. It's going to be safe for birds, safe for pets, safe for you. Perfectly fine. Not going to poison. Yep. Again, I'm using my own yard. I create stuff. This is stuff we make. The recipe I've been working on for 15 years or more. I'm, I'm mainly worried about myself and my gardens and my dogs. You just happen to benefit from that. So I don't want to poison. If I poison Vincent, I'm going. I'll be in jail. I mean, I'll, be, I'll be under some bridge someplace. I got to make sure that, you know, our, our families, so we, all of our products are safe and Use common sense. Don't put in the dog bowl or something. Like that. One more question, Ken. Of the potinias, they're about six, seven foot tall. Nice. The deer, but the deer ate them back last year when I was gone, and now they look like mushrooms. <laughs> oh. Like this, and then a nice, beautiful head. Yeah. yeah. Know, is there a way to? So, so those you listening online, he's got red tip potinia. So I can summarize this: where the deer came in and had some deer pressure yeah. while you were traveling, and then. Uh, they ate the bottoms where they could graze her, and then at the tops are like a mushroom shape. Any way to get that? Uh, there is a way to do it, fertilize, okay. and keep the deer off. Yeah. And they'll do that. If you've got deer pressure and you can't fence it or, fertilize, or they make some repellents and stuff, if the deer are that, deer, you get that much pressure, I might just go with it. I might just prune them. I'd actually cut all the foliage off and make them look like a little tree. What, if you can't fight them, join them, kind of thing, remember that? Yeah. So you either gotta figure out how to keep the deer off, or join the deer going, hey, I grazed it for you, there's nothing left. Yeah. This year I put a deer spray. That, yeah. Does that work? Yeah. 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 They The deer spray that repels all that kind of stuff, uh, that does work. The secret is rip to potinia, it grows so fast, you need to keep up on the new growth. Or as soon as it gets tender new growth, they love that stuff. They're coming in grazing. And then they invite friends and families over, and it's a block party at your house. 